Welcome to um, Flow New Year, Stay Home New Year. Um, and today we are we have some two lovely guests um, that we'll be sharing space with. Um, my name is Chinita Pindara Potter, um, and I'm the executive director of the Seed Project, so, uh, Southeast Asian Diaspora Project. Um, and uh, this is our first day of our three-day virtual fest. Um, and so day one, uh, we are i um, going to talk about New Year's festivities, traditions, and uh, we have two amazing writers who will be joining us. Um, so um, before we get started, though, just some simple house rules that um, I will go through them. If you can see it on your screen, they're pretty straightforward. So um, we are recording publicly. If you have any problems with this, um, let us know. Um, and please do mute your mic, but of course, don't mute your voice. Um, if you have video on, please just check um, the spotlight. Feel free to also use the chat box if you have questions, concerns, anything like that. And also, we want this to be a really engaging, um, safe and welcoming conversation. So zero tolerance for any form of hate. So if we catch you, we will kick you out. Um, at least Catherine will. Um, so, um, Welcome to Flow New Year again. Um, I'm Chanita Pindara Potter, um, and I have two incredible guests with me. Um, I do want to introduce them. Um, Brian Tawara, say hello. Everybody, um, hello everybody. And then we have, um, I call her Sok. Sok Sui, say Hi. hello. It's Sok and Terry Sui, so it's Lei Chanam Happy New Year, everyone. Thank you, thank you. Um, and could you both introduce maybe in one sentence about yourself, who you are, what you do, everybody? So, you want to take that first? Ah, uh, okay. A Cambodian writer from the Bronx. Oh, <laughs> a Cambodian writer from the Bronx. And um, I'm also a PhD student in English and a mother. All right, and I'm Brian Tawar. I am a uh, now American poet based here in the Midwest. In fact, I've got an all new book out from Satu Press called Before We Remember We Dream. And I've been working very closely with you know, many members of our community to help rebuild our you know, literary traditions in diaspora, especially as we prepare for the 45th anniversary of all of our journeys this year. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we are going to um, go through a few things. Um, we originally had somebody who was going to do a one-on-one -on, -one on New Year's, um, and um, unfortunately that person is no longer available. So I'll be doing just a quick overview of um, what usually happens um, during a Theravada Buddhist New Year, what it's all about. Um, we also want to give a quick shout out to um, our design team for helping put together our New Year's resource deck, um, which can be downloaded from our website. Um, so Catherine will post that in the chat box as well for you all to see. Um, but you can get it from our website um, and feel free to follow through um, with me as I talk about it a little bit. Um, and then we'll talk about just a critical discussion with uh, our two writers about kind of uh, what does it mean to be diaspora, to celebrate in a time of disruption, um, and what sort of traditions could we carry from the past, present, and into the future. So um, first off, that's us. So New Year in Diaspora in Time of Disruption. Um, those are our Twitter handles. So if you catch anything, you want to, um, you know, anything amazing that we may say, um, please feel free to share um, and follow us. So where is Theravada Buddhist New Year celebrated? Um, so this is a quick trivia for anybody who wants to guess what these countries are. <laughs> I, would think, I would think it's a good, good trivia for a lot of people in our audience. Um, but feel free to put it in the chat box if you know the answer. But I'll give you 20 seconds to do that. Wow, don't all answer at once. <laughs> Unless Brian wants to. I know I know you both know the answer. But... 
Okay. So. Mm. That was a quick trivia. Um, I think <laughs> most people know where it is. Very quick one question trivia. Um, but yeah, we know that Theravada Buddhist New Year is celebrated in um, Burma, Cambodia, um, Laos, Thailand, um, Sri Lanka, some parts of Vietnam primarily, um, and different parts of um, Asia and Southeast Asia. So this is how you say Happy New Year in all these different languages. Um, and so this was designed by Michael Saucer. So shout out to Michael Saucer, who's our board member, who did these amazing illustrations and resource deck. So Theravada Buddhist New Year is basically summed up in three days. Um, and in some countries, it's three to four days, sometimes longer, um, depending on the community. Uh, we know that we can't generalize for all communities and how they celebrate, but and especially within the diaspora, which also vary by community. Um, and so, but these three days, um, we break down to day one is kind of goodbye to the old year. So it's the last day of the old year. Day two is the in-between day. So that's basically kind of the longest day is what people consider it to be. Um, and so uh, we have a summary of that in the resource deck you can read. So I won't go through all the boring details. Day three is the actual New Year's Day is where we welcome New Year's. Um, you give your blessings to elders um, and you know you clean the home um, and do um, other traditions with your local temple, um, cleansing and washing with the statues, etc. And so that is basically in a nutshell the three days. Um, and then the symbols and festivities that happen um, primarily is with um, you know Buddha, water, flowers, um, and then with music dance, games, and of course eating, nonstop eating, <laughs> so for most of our communities. So that's basically, um, in a nutshell, um, about the three-day um, kind of long festival that we typically would have, um, and different things happen in the home and outside the home um, within our communities. So feel free to read through the resource deck from our website. Um, and so because I'm not a cultural expert in this, um, I won't be detailing anything else. Um, and um, all of it is in the resource deck that you can definitely feel free to um, take a look at and share any um, feedback or questions that you have. And we'll be sure to try to answer them too. So that is basically the fastest thing ever for everything you need to know. Um, about our New Year's. So I am going to stop the slides now. I think we have a lot more people coming in here. And I'm gonna check any questions I'm missing. Okay. Yes, thank you. Oh yeah, there you go. A lot of you know where it's celebrated. So happy new year to those of you who celebrate it. Okay, so we'll get started. So this is meant to be very um, engaging and fun and we hope you enjoy the conversation. Um, so we'll get started. Um, I guess, you know, what does it mean to really celebrate New Year's in this time? So I wanted to start with um, a question with both of you. Could you share a story, kind of a, New Year's memory that comes to your mind right now? And we'll go to Brian. Okay, great. So, wow. That's a, I think um, back um, then, you know, for my own journey coming back into the community, it was a very, um, a very long journey then that you know, I didn't really get a chance to come back to the Lao culture until um, really about 2001 and you know, 2003 then because I had been adopted by an American pilot and his family. So in that search, um, I think part of what informs our, our conversation today is that I didn't really get a chance to be a part of um, Lao traditions um, until about, you know, 
wow, a little over 12, 13 years ago. So this is one of the things that I think is important for all of us is that we see that um, we all have these diverse germs and these um, stories. And what I want to make sure um, that I was so happy with people who welcomed me into the community and showed me around the New Year traditions was this idea that we don't have to be um, afraid of engaging with that. That, uh, let's see, the best thing that we can do with one another is encourage this curiosity, this confidence, and that as you start to learn more things, then that we ask these questions from one another. Um, one of the things that I always noted for um, that was that, um, you know, uh, people try to show me what did it mean to um, be around the Buddhist monks? Um, what did it mean to see all these traditions and um, all, all together at once? And you want to be part of it um, as you're going into it. You want to be everywhere, but you can't be everywhere. So you start to have to pick and choose. And in that thing, though, you start to see how our communities start to focus on a sense of harmony of reflection. How do we include one another? How do we become mindful of our time? So that's you know, something that as we start doing more conversations, we're going to. But so what about you? What are some of your New Year's memories? Well, I, you know, I talked about this in, um, in our sort of pre-discussion. There are a couple of memories from childhood. But uh, before I get to that, I think of more of, uh, I think, visuals, right? You know, being mm -hmm. in the temple and Seeing and seeing the monks in the saffron colored robes, seeing the metal bowls with mm -hmm. the with the holy water and the offerings, and seeing people go in a line to uh, to give to give rice and put it into the bowls of uh, each monk. Uh, but also, I think for for someone who was I I'm, I've been you know I I was raised by Cambodian parents and Cambodian, um, but often I felt. Uh, I felt like I was performing these tasks and not quite understanding uh, what their significant significance was because they weren't being explained to me. Um, mm -hmm. It was something that you did, um, something that you observed, and then you pick it up and eventually figure it out. Um, but as far as like actual memories, uh, there were two, and these are both uh, relating to my family. Uh, just to, uh, one, it was one, uh, upcoming new year my mom was hurriedly cleaning cleaning the house and like uh, just like it was such an uproar cleaning like a you know uh, the drapes and everything and was just she was like hurriedly moving around I, didn't, I couldn't understand like you know like, was somebody visiting somebody coming she's like David that's coming David da coming and I'm like who is that who's David da how come I never heard of this person yeah and and David da I learned like years later is like one of the new year angels <laughs> so um so that's who she was cleaning for. Um, but my mom also, like, ghosts, spirits, ancestors, angels, you know, they're all the sort of the same kind of entity. They are, like, as physically there with us as, you know, uh, as this computer. And then another one was, uh, we, I always loved to see the altars that my, my mom would put together. And, you know, depending, depending on how much time she had after coming home from working at the hotel, would see what she'd actually put on there and you know typically there was like two bottles of soda some oranges some of those are uh, like china those are uh, i i call them chinese candies where it's just like honey with uh, honey and peanuts or sesame seed that's you know hardened and made to these rectangular shapes or maybe we put up some other kinds of stuff but um we always really look forward to the end of new year so we could drink the soda but as we got as we were watching each day my older brother, who's really uh, very superstitious, would, would um, mark the line of where the soda was, and he was convinced that some that the spirits were drinking the soda. Mm -hmm. And so he's like, hey, "Look, it's less than it's less than two days ago," and uh, and I actually started to believe that. But then again, I, I was pretty gullible. So I so those are my memories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, one of the things as we were preparing for this conversation that I thought was so important to understand though is that you know, under your traditions, then, no matter where you're coming from, from the, um, from the Cambodian traditions, Lao, Hmong, um, Burmese, and so on, I think the important thing that we have to do, especially in our diaspora, is to remember that these traditions are still ultimately, while heavily symbolic in many instances, are also comprehensible. It's supposed to be something that um, you can drill down um, 
very, it's like, you know, to um, some very, very esoteric levels. You, um, to, you can make it as complicated as you want it to be, but there is also still a fundamental element then, like as you're finding out, know, just, you know, um, simple things of just cleaning the house allows you to be a part of that tradition. And I think, um, as I look at it now, as we were looking through the deck, um, that seed pieced together is that it was important to understand that many traditions inform our own Southeast Asian tradition, that it, um, Nan San Khan comes from a Hindu um, term or phrase, right? It's like we are observing, um, it's like, you know, paying homage to the Buddhist monks, and yet at the same time, we're measuring time um, using the um, Chinese um, astrological system, such as um, this being the year of the rat, um, then of the Buddhist mm -hmm. calendar year of 2562. And so what I find myself saying is intriguing, though, is that for those of us in diaspora, no matter where we are, you know, whether we're in the US or Canada, France, Australia, for example, is that I think we should also be able to read that as a question and an opportunity then uh, what will our own traditions bring in? Um, let's see, you know, um, some of us out here in the Midwest um, with our experience in a snowstorm. Then. That's not something that you know, the traditional communities in um, Southeast Asia usually have to deal with. Like, oh yeah, what's your snow contingency plan? Right, right. So, yeah. so how do we, so you both touched on, you know, the symbols of like ghosts and spirits and altars and just cleaning the house. Mm -hmm. Those are some memories from when you were younger or things that you participate but have no understanding or very little understanding. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit about what some of those, those stories are. Like, is, is there a favorite story that you have about some of these symbols and how did you come about understanding them or even knowing what they are? Mm -hmm. well, yeah. How, how, how do we learn about those things as part of the diaspora when we don't have access to those answers? I don't know. It just feels like, I feel like I have such a basic answer for me. It's just, mm -hmm. it's really just being um, immersed in, in the culture of, of my home, of my, of my parents. It was just, they don't really talk very much, you know, on account of, we're just going to say, we're going to say trauma, right? Uh, undiagnosed uh, post-traumatic stress disorder from surviving the Khmer Rouge. Um, and so I, the way that I picked up a lot was just by observing. And it wasn't the kind of home culture where you could ask questions uh, pointedly or straightforward. And because of that, uh, I grew to be very good at picking up on body language. Um, Mm -hmm. And so um, a lot of a lot of the things that that I learned I learned from listening, from watching, um, from paying attention to gestures, um, even like uh, in a uh, like sonic and auditory way, like you know listening to certain sighs or tones from my parents so uh, when they spoke. So you know through all those ways I picked up one how I was growing growing up uh, with parents who were you know. Uh, refugees who were adjusting, but also it's like, what makes us Khmer and, you know, how does that look? Is it just about the, the things that we are practicing and have inherited and are, um, are just, you know, doing with our bodies, these actions, you know, how else do we inhabit this idea of, of being part of the diaspora, particularly you don't, when you are, you know, airdropped, basically, right, in, in New York City, where it, refugees airdropped into the Bronx urban jungle. And it's like, okay, so what does it look like now for us to be Khmer in the 1980s? You know, New York City was also in a very uh, dangerous, kind of scary place then. Not, not that it isn't right now, by the way, I'm in the epicenter of the COVID virus. So, you know, um, so this is all actually surprisingly familiar to me. I feel like I've been like waiting, waiting for this kind of, uh, I think I, I've been waiting for that moment for the refugee um, refugee ideas to like um, emerge again uh, mm -hmm. because I've always I've always been been thinking like we're never going to have enough mm -hmm. you know right. Right. don't waste and all those things. Sorry, I feel like I'm getting a bit off topic, but I'm thinking about the kind of Khmer that that I am 
in addition to taking whatever my parents could give us was also just was a Khmer survivor, a Khmer survivor in the U.S. That's a large part of my Southeast Asian identity and how, and how I see myself uh, building our culture here, which is why I, I as a writer, am, uh, am very much focused on the, the diaspora because uh, our sole reason for being in this country is, is, uh, is because of um, Western imperialism and, and the rise of the Khmer Rouge regime. We came here under duress and because of that, it's going to be inexplicably linked to our presence here and the way that we talk about ourselves and continue to identify. So to be Khmer is not just to have these holidays and to wear the clothing and to, it's, it's also about the loss of our arts and culture and a population of people and having to adjust. So that kind of cultural adaptation and growth is, is so much a part of, of who we are. Thank you. So I, I really appreciate your um, points around um, what is your Khmerness, right? And your identity and how, how do we hold these type of traditions or culture when we have been um, pretty much removed from it um, for the most part. So Brian, talk a little bit about that. How should we be measuring our loudness, especially for um, someone like you who mm -hmm. is a Lao adoptee? Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit more about that. And that's really a good question. I mean, I think the um, thing about it that as I look at the new traditions and what I always try to um, teach my younger students as well, you know, Ben, as they're going through their own search for their identity, their roots, Ben, is the idea that, you know, when you're engaged in our traditions, we can't just be focused on trying to preserve them exactly as the elders might have done it 200, 300, 400 years ago, because that's going to be something that just stresses you out. Um, that's going to be also an impossibility um, in some ways, but it's instead that I think the healthiest way for us to navigate that is to see that it's a continuation of a dialogue. It's not supposed to be just this um, repetition thing. What helped in my journey and what I, I often tell people about it um, when we look going through that is that, let's see, is that we need to remember what a New Year's is, is that the first day is a reflection, it's a house cleansing. It, it's both literal and it's metaphorical that you're taking a, a moment and you're pausing and you're just saying that, you know what, no matter what else happens in the year, any sort of craziness can happen out there. Maybe you get a new job, maybe you have a baby, maybe you have you know, a graduation, any number of you know, things can happen in your year. But you also get this anchor point of this quick pause where you say, yeah, but right now, whatever else happens, I know for sure one thing's going to happen that I'm going to make a commitment or I have the opportunity to make a commitment to participate in that, to reflect on what happened. And I think what you know, always intrigued me about is also the cyclical nature then is that this um, keeps us a little humble that, um, you, know, you know, sometimes our egos can make us say that this is the most important moment ever, but at the same time in all of our lives, no, we're not the first people who've gone through you know, this chaos or this upheaval. You know, when, you, know, you know, whether we're successful or whether we're having a bad year. So talk through. about yes. Yeah, yeah. So talk about this disruption. Mm -hmm. um, what are some ways we should be celebrating New Year's in quarantine now, especially mm -hmm. the second generation, third generation, and just the younger generation? Mm -hmm. oh. So. Wait, I'm sorry. I, I was trying to read the comments. I totally missed the question. <laughs> that again. Yes, yes, no, this is going good. Um, my question was, um, like, despite the disruption, what, what are some ways um, that our younger generation um, should be or how should they be celebrating this new year in quarantine? Well, I'm, you know, I, I don't want to give a directive <laughs> or... Uh, I, obviously, I can come up with some ideas, but first, I think I, I, I think it, I, I have to like take it back to the self and check in mm -hmm. with myself. Sorry, I see my dog over there. <laughs> she's, dog. she's a 
she's got her own cleansing thing it's called it now but um uh i was just thinking about how i had to forgive myself for not clean uh cleaning the house mm -hmm. i mean I, I i cleaned the dishes and i did the best that i could but you know that's that's i think uh kind of a, an example of how you know there are, there are the things that we intend to do and the things that we consider part of the tradition but you know um, when the time comes what is the best that we can do the best that i can do is clean mm -hmm. myself up so i can be here with you all my altar is still not clean i would like to wipe it down i want to you know put some uh kamai rice wine and some hennessy out you know as offerings but um for me i i actually decided not to not to drink uh not to drink whiskey for uh, for a bit oh. <laughs> and if anybody knows me i really That's real. i really love my bourbon um and i was thinking about the idea of cleaning and cleansing the uh, the relationship because you know we, mm -hmm. we're in kind of passover and easter as well i mean it's not it's not a coincidence that all these all these uh, holidays have come together around the same around the same time and i'm thinking about what cleaning cleansing and how that relates to sacrifice and you know there is something that is kind of being given up in order to to make something clean or in order to mm -hmm. cleanse whether it is uh, the home the spirit oneself so uh, i'm just thinking like you know mm -hmm. in lieu of doing things such as cleaning your home what is another way that that you can cleanse mm -hmm. yourself and it doesn't have to like it, nothing is at this point i feel like you know when you are in crisis uh, nothing is sacrosanct. It mm -hmm. shouldn't be. That's just absurd. And and especially as as the diaspora, as children refugees or 1.5 uh, generation uh, refugees, God, you're just you're just making do. What makes sense where you are right now? For me, it's just making sure that I'm not going to the store because I, there are about like 600, maybe five or 600 cases of COVID within my two mile uh, radius of this um, of my zip code. So mm -hmm. I, you know, like, I'm thinking that's my way of, of staying clean. Um, mm -hmm. Because I, I actually love, love to go to the store. I love shopping and then, you know, cooking for my family and to mm -hmm. not have that is, is a sadness and sacrifice for me. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I'm thinking I, I want, I want my peoples out there to think more conceptually about about this new year instead and take this opportunity to look uh, into oneself and think about what these ideas mean and how you can go about interpreting them. I think that is what I, that is the advice that I would offer and let it be something that is personal to, to yourself and don't, and don't let these ideas as somehow you not doing it the way that it has been done by the previous generations is somehow going to negate your blank, fill in the blank, Southeast Asian-ness. Mm -hmm. It's taken me 20 years to get to this point where I can, and I still feel, I still feel like I'm not a good parent to my Cambodian daughter because I couldn't teach her Khmer in the way that I wanted to, because I wanted to teach it to, to her the right way. But then again, we get into the judgment words, right? You know, the correct, right, and wrong. And those are things that just don't make sense, nor are they relevant in the ideas mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. cultural identity and heritage. Because yeah. that is something that cannot be taken away from us. It is already embedded in who we are. We are born this way. How do we strengthen it? How do we find ways that, that to, to glorify it, right? To emanate it through the other mm -hmm. things that are in our lives. I know I'm like sermon soapbox kind of way. Right? <laughs> But it's taken me a long time to be like, it is within yourself. Don't allow, don't allow other people to say that you have to do it this way. It just says if you do not speak your own language, if you do not speak your heritage language, don't let that hold you back. Mm -hmm. I know that sometimes that's our way of entering our communities, but mm -hmm. that does not make you less of where you come mm -hmm. from or your parents' okay. children. Well, that actually leads into a great question that we talk about it a lot um, than with the question of, um, you know, whenever you're around your parents and your elders, so many of us in so many of our traditions get you know, to a point where we feel like we're being criticized, that we don't speak enough of our um, language, we don't understand all of our traditions and everything else like that. And I find myself saying that, particularly during the New Year's um, season, that this is a time though that we need to just kind of take stock 
step back and understand that it's important to take risk and to appreciate um, that this one idea that one of the um, Thai scholars was talking about is that, you know, you know we, they call it incomplete language acquisition, but that's actually not you know, necessarily what's going on. What it is, is that you, know, you, are, you, know, you have to see it as a new dialect is emerging, is that mm -hmm. do you have the, all the language that you need to speak to your grandparents or to your elders or cousins or your brothers? I don't know. You, it's like this is be it's like if things are getting done, then that's the dialect that you have. That and it's a very it's a very interesting possibility. Then mm -hmm. that um, let's see. I think the question that I had to think about it a lot in the nineteen nineties and the early two thousands was just, well, you're always going to run into that situation where you're just going to run into this barrier of things you don't know that. Um, do you know how to order um, the food you want to eat? Okay, great. But do you know how to do the funeral rituals? Okay, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Maybe you know only part of half of that. Then the question is, is do you know all the words for the, that's like, you know, for wedding rituals, everything. So many different you know, parts of you know, our regular life, you know, then. And, oh. and the question is, is that, that's where um, you, you remember when we were talking mm -hmm. to um, over South mm -hmm. Bend, um, Refugee Nation and so on, right? Mm -hmm. Where um, it's a chance yeah. to be a part of community that right. the rest of the community helps you fill in gaps. That's why we need one another is that you, know, right. you, you don't know all right. the words about how to repair a car in Khmer. Right. Well, right. Mm -hmm. So when you, I want to go back to when um, Sok was talking about the idea of cleansing, um, right? Like if there's one thing that we like all know, we know that we're supposed to clean. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> clean out our homes, clean out the past, right? Mm -hmm. Flush yeah. out all the bad, right? Bad voodoo. Um, so there's this aspect of cleansing and then in comparison to aspect of preservation or self-preservation, mm -hmm. right? So what should we be cleaning? What should we be keeping? Mm -hmm. um, that, that's my question to you both. Um, and also, um, so I think you said you also have an altar you wanted to show us. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, it's like, it's dusty right now. I mean. You show us how to clean it. <laughs> how, what is, yeah, well, how do you, how do you talk about that? What, what? What should we be cleaning? What should we preserve? Oh my gosh. Wow. Um, I feel like I should not be <laughs> asked these questions and I don't feel like right. Uh, I don't and know. Then, yeah, and maybe we should, um, let's talk about then your role as literary artists, um, poets like yourself. Well, why, why is it so important? Language, you know, Brian talked about language and there are some words that we know, some words we don't know, um, and sometimes we don't know the meaning of it too. Mm -hmm. But um, you both are poets yourself, um, and tell us a little bit about why, you know, why is that important during a pandemic too? Why, why are you both as artists important in a time like this? Who wants to go first? <laughs> Brian. All right, so. Huh, me? Okay, I'll do it. Um, you know, let me let me just say that like poetry doesn't save lives. So let's be clear about that. Oh shush. Poetry doesn't make money. Uh let's just but I think that the, the, the concepts and the things that come um and the kind of thinking that comes as a result of language within poetry, I think that's where the power is. Now, uh, as someone who has studied the uh, language acquisition um and I, and I think I think daily about about Khmer words and English words and their origins, how they relate, why I can remember some and why I can't remember others unless they are pronounced to me, or that um, I have different languages for different kinds of things. For example, um, I still barely understand. There's a word that my mom my mom used to. Well, she always spoke in Khmer to me when I was growing up. But when she would uh, take care of me, like you know, with with band-aids and you know when she was trying to heal me she had she would use a specific kind of Khmer language that I still don't quite know what the uh, translation 
is because I learned it originally in Khmer, whereas many other things I learned, you know, uh, I eventually learned and associate with English. So there's certain words like how, it's like, I still like only know that as a Khmer word and a Khmer concept. So like, I, 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 I think it's like inflamed, uh, but she would like say, and so like, I think there, there's a certain like way that in my mind, I have a separation of, of like language from various, like the various rooms within my mind, right? One is like the healing arts and uh, medicine. That's where Khmer is. And then, you know, for, you know, my heart language, that would be for Khmer because with Khmer and a bit of English because my relationship to uh, other people, to my community is uh, through calling them brother and sister Bong, Bong mm. Pong, you know, uh, uh, Ye Ta Ming Po, you know, and, and so forth. It's like the, the, the linguistic connection uh, because uh, naturally in our Southeast Asian languages, you know, we, we refer to each other through our uh, relationship, uh, our, um, you know, a family relationship, right? Mm -hmm. Older brother, older sister, younger brother, younger sister, and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, um, yeah, but as far as like, but as far as language in these times, I language, you know, language is not static. It, it is constantly evolving. And it is this living thing that we use to, uh, to continue to form new ways of thinking about ourselves and the world that we live in. So, so that is to me, the beauty and the strength of language as we are living in these times and how we talk about, talk about how we are living and how we will survive mm -hmm. or how we are, how we are hurting and, and trying to heal. I, I mean, I think that's one of the things that as we look at the journey of so many people in diaspora, um, then is that our language connects us and it transforms us. It is the thing that um, we try to pass on to the next generation then, but you don't come from nowhere. But um, as we see in recent years here, or even um, in recent weeks, that you know, people will try to accuse you of belonging to one community or another or else that you, know, you don't belong here. And um, there can be, it's like I would feel you know, very bad for many of our children, um, who think that they don't come from this tradition, that, um, and that's where even a simple word like sabaydi um, or um, any of these words, you know, you think about it. How many words connect you back to you know, your fathers, your uncles, your mothers, your grandmothers, you know, for example, that if you had a chance to you know, share those words with them, you know, you know does that affirm your relationship? You know, it, and you know, I think as someone was saying, you, but, you know, um, good language um, helps keep us sane, that it explores the possibilities of who we are, who we've been, and who we can be. And that's um, where some people think they're not poets. They think that, um, you know, what does a poet do? I mean, you know, mm -hmm. What does a poet do, Brian? Right. <laughs> so, what, what do poets do? Um, so yeah, someone right. in the chat box said that <laughs> poetry, um, you you both may not think you're you're very important, but um, someone in the chat box said that uh, poetry keeps her sane. I mean, do you agree? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. For me, the poetry is a um, way of taking those risks. It's a way of um, seeing so many different things from so many different corners of our lives and our experience and processing it through, say, a Lao American, a Southeast Asian American, and Asian American lens, for example. We're even trying to get in touch with a cosmic self, this part of it where it's like, you know, all other labels aside, um, how am I going to go through the rest of the world? And um, no, that's a, a good poem helps you sort out the world, what you experienced, what you dreamt, what you remembered, what you imagined. And that's something that um, we try to bring into um, the lives of so many other people then, is to challenge. It's to challenge that thing that would erase our stories and our identities ever was. Yeah. yeah. So, how about you, So, I mean, well, what is poetry to you? Poetry is, in a nutshell, that thing that we are trying to say, mm -hmm. but the words fall short. Mm -hmm. And so, we create this experience through these words. 
so that we can at least feel it in our bodies. It's always about, the, about going back to the body, at least in the kind of poetry that I'm, I'm trying to do. And, and the thing is that, that words, words have limitations, right? Words, are, words and language are, are constructed by humans, but they're mm -hmm. not the original thing. And so poetry is part of that. It is this like construction, um, but it is a way to make light of something that we cannot truly verbalize, but the attempt is always there. And it's the play, the play and the beauty that comes from that attempt. Well, I think back to it, right, is that um, without going into a deep English literature conversation, there was a um, poet named Milton involved. And Milton you know, wrote, yeah. a, um, wrote a very famous play, uh, poem um, called um, Paradise Lost. And part of it was, was that Milton came out of the aftermath of the English Civil War. And in this Civil War, you know, then he experienced and he saw things that he just realized that the English language didn't have words for that you know, he actually had to spend a lot of time inventing all new words, phantasmagoria, and it just, you know, it could go through this whole list of things where um, he felt that the English people needed these new words you know, to express that because for everything else that um, they had done, there's something more that we could add. And so I think that's the same thing that we now have mm -hmm. to do you know, for all of us as young professionals, as students, and everything else like that is to look at the experience of our communities, our elders, our ancestors, and the next generation, and to help them find the words for which there would otherwise not be words. You know, there will be moments where we have to um, help them find words for things that there never were words for before. And then at the mm -hmm. same time, you take a look at a pen, for example, you know, um, and you have to you know, use your poetry, you have to use your words to say, you know, that, you know a pen, can be you know, something that tells a Lao story or a Khmer story. This pen isn't just something that only belongs to a particular society, then, that you know, your own stories can be embedded within it. That you know, one pen, it's like you have enough ink in here that you could write the United States Constitution. You could form a nation. Maybe you write a love letter. Maybe you just simply make a promise to someone. But that's what's embedded in this pen and you as a poet and as a, as a creator, whatever the tradition you come from, that's what you have to help people unlock and untap for themselves as well. You know, to take those yeah. little moments and to really transform them into something special. Right. I really love the points about, um, you both made about, there, there are some things that are not words that um, poetry does. And I, I think in times like this, that's why it's so crucial Right. Some things um, when when people are asking us nowadays, how are you doing? Are you OK? We don't even know how to answer that sometimes. Mm -hmm. Right. So it might be a sigh. It might be here's a pen. Here's what I think in poetry. So yeah. all of it is very beautiful. Um, so, I mean, we only have a few minutes left before you both share your amazing poetry. But let's talk about, you know, um, we talked a lot about disruptions and in the diaspora and what we're carrying. Um, from the past. So in this first day of New Year's, mm -hmm. what are you both letting go? <laughs> and also, um, what should we learn, I guess, from, you know, uh, what are some things that you've learned from your past and present? And, and what, what should we be carrying forward into the future? Well, for me, I think I am doing a lot of work um, to just be more open to outcome, not attached to outcome. That's the, that's the important lesson about that is that, you know, like the old joke you know, in the West goes, right? It's like, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. Um, <laughs> and I think that's you know, the same thing that you know, we see is that what I loved about the New Year you know, traditions is that they teach you to be fearless, that, you know, that, you know Things have happened before, they're going to happen again. They'll happen after we're all long gone. And that you just find a part, you know, if you, it's like, you know, with the lesson of the year of the rat, I think, is that, um, you know, you find a way to survive. But it's like, you know, by any means necessary, perhaps, but you find that space where you belong. And that's a pretty nice corner of the universe. So that's what I'm trying to look at. Thanks, Brian. So, how about you? There were so many questions. 
yeah, like, what are you carrying? Yeah, what are you carrying? What are you leaving behind? What are you carrying forward into the future? Oh, these are really big, beautiful questions. Um, I'm not. Sure. <laughs> it could be anything. Like I'm gonna carry my altar into the future. <laughs> oh, yeah. I want to well, actually. So I, I'm wearing um, the only heirloom I have, and mm. my my grandmother wove this. And mm. that it survived the Khmer Rouge. So I will be carrying this for as long as I can. This is beautiful silk. Uh, it's a krama, which is the uh, the typical Cambodian scarf that has a particular kind of pattern. And we thank you, Anna, for saying that it's beautiful. Um, so I carry that and the artifacts that I, you know, whatever other artifacts I have, which which are very few. Um, I'm trying to carry the memory, memories of joy of people mm -hmm. uh, with me into the future and, and the, the beauty and the struggle and the challenges I have with, with dialogue between English and Khmer for me. And that's something that I'm, that I'm exploring right now, I'll be reading a poem that kind of uh, plays around with that. So I, that, so that's what I'm carrying with me. It's just more opportunities for for growth in in this like that that goes further inside as well as outside. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, thank you. So without further ado, um, I do want to make time for um, poetry reading for both of you. So I don't know who wants to start, but it sounds like Brian might want to start next. <laughs> what? So little Brian and so. Um, but yeah, Brian, what is um, the poem that you're going to share with us um, in closing? Um, and then we'll go to Soph as well with uh, a piece that you'll share. Um, and um, any context you want to give about it would be great. All right. Well, like I said, this whole conversation has been about the question of taking risks. So I'll, take, I'll read you a poem from my new collection. Um, Brian, you know, but encapsulates a lot of what we've been doing, Ben, and I hope it gives you know, confidence to the younger students and to anyone else who comes across this, Ben, to, uh, to, you know, to be mindful, you know, to be happy to take these risks, and to, um, and to understand that it's always a journey that continues, that you know, the conversation doesn't have to end, that it can go as long as we want. You know, ben. This is called Irons. After 30 years of poetry, I learned at least 100 words in no less than two tongues, unique to our journey as refugees, to fill vacuums and bloody gaps of our disrupted, disputed histories. Recovering families, dismantling enemies, identifying the official tools of allies bombing us for our own good, their policies of destruction and resettlement, how to win hearts and minds in diaspora. From DC to Modesto, Anchorage to the Twin Cities, walking into a thousand classrooms, strangers to the beauty of Incha, Savannakit, a heartfelt Sabaidi, gathering ink storm clouds to change worlds. One poem still can't tell my whole story. And apparently I get a doggy accompaniment here. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. <laughs> Such are Zoom calls, right? It's either it's either the dogs or the kids. <laughs> Thank you. That was beautiful, Brian. So, oh, okay. Um, so uh, I just read this the other day for an, uh, another Zoom reading. So uh, if anybody's heard this, well, now you get a second time. It's uh, I, I wrote this about a month ago after a conference after hearing someone play with. Uh, sounds of language, and so uh, I'm happy to be able to share uh, share a bit of this confusion with you. It's called context clues. Nyam nyom nyam nom nom no nyai no no not nut near nub none now not nope next nip not. These are the sounds and yet the words differ. I want to say, but that won't put you at ease no more than don't worry does in English. The sounds float in my memory and release in situations where the sounds become relevant, unearthed for those who pronounce the labiodental lip 
to tongue sounds with a cluck, a glottal, a breath, aspirate and aspiration, hear, how, hold, home, help, who, humble, heart, whole. We are near the tree, three a bay, three bay, may slay, saw slay. What is translation? What do their English equivalents matter? They aspire for accuracy but are not answers. Diphthongs and umlauts, vowels extending into different shapes of the mouth, closed or open in the back, swallowed and regurgitated. Bay, bong, but, bray, bye, but, bye, but, bar, boss, bold, bit. By bend. Twist the diction until it sounds authentic, local, regional, mistaken for someone else. Speak to belong, speak to other, speak to own, whether one's or another's. Crippling crunch of consonants, crew of long vowels crashing into the sea, this is history. For a language, the vocal stops, child and mother end with open vowels as if moaning, calling, own, my, my, my is my cry. Before I have the words in the womb, in the crib, the cry elongates. Um, sorry, oh my god, my, my thing just skipped. That was great. Uh, let me continue. If, because duration is the key to being heard. Even ma, with its vocal stops, I defy it. Shout ma. Hold the A into an A. Ah. Does this really, does it sing? My voice teacher wants me to sing pure vowels in Italian opera. What is purity? What makes a language impure? A woman answers yes with the cha, unaspirated, the a, lengthened, while men are cut off, and ma, the tongue stopping itself behind the upper teeth, the teeth a cage of mouth that seeks opening. What gender opens and what pricks? I seek trust in the seed of this language, but I, it grows with certainty, or uncertainty, even. Thank you, Alkanjran, and also my book. That was so beautiful. For everyone who is able to, please give them both a round of applause or jazz hands. <laughs> that was beautiful. Thank you so much to both of you. Um, I just want to share really quickly too um, links to your work. So you can find Brian Tawara's um, poem there, um, Before We Remember We Dream, through Sachi Press. Um, and Sukhantara Yusui, um, author in New York, is her latest book. So please, please, please support these incredible artists. Um, and for more about the rest of our festivities, um, do check out our website, fsuproject.org forward slash flow 2020. Um, we have a whole another two days lined up as well. Um, but before we end, is there anything else that you haven't shared or talked about that you both would like to leave this audience with? Brian, so? I'll go first, uh, just so I can get this out of the way. Um, I want to, I want to confess and say that I actually have not been to Temple in probably over, definitely over seven or eight years. Um, my mother, uh, my dad retired to Georgia a few years ago, and my mom went down with her uh, a couple of years ago. And so I don't have any um, family in the mm -hmm. Bronx anymore, um, in New York City. And so it's especially hard to not have, because my family has been my doorway um, to that. I opened the door to, through them to go into that culture. And so I'm definitely in a place of adjustment where, right now, where it's like, how do I keep those things alive? but in a way that I can pass on as a legacy to my own child who, you know, very much identifies as Khmer, even if she is not, you know, practicing the rituals. So, um, so that is a, a way that I actually want to cleanse of myself uh, to, to the people who are here, just so that, so that you know that I, I so do not have mm -hmm. this down. <laughs> and it's okay. Absolutely. And I'll try to forgive myself. Absolutely. It's okay. Yeah, I think that really just goes back to the heart of the um, whole thing there that um, I hope, you know, as you meditate on it, as you um, look through the process, is that 
a New Year's festival, let's really face it, is a, is a very chaotic thing. So, and when it's really, you know, that's a, uh, you know, let's be real about it. It's that no matter where, where we are, whether we were back in the old country or here in, you know, the United States or you know, any country that you go to observe in New Year, it's a lot of chaos that's you know, going on in there. And it's a question of a challenge for you as well. And I think I hope we all take it um, deep down you know, into the way that we explore that going forward, young and older life, is what do we let go? What do we take the risk on? What do we you know, say, this is how you know, we understand you know, the many different ways to be part of our communities and our traditions. That's the thing. But you know, there's no one way you know, to be Lao, Cambodian, Hmong, you know, Burmese, Thai, or so on but that you, know, you will add to, add to it, like flowers on a tree or something like that. You know, let's right. see, you know, that, right. this is what, that this is what we're all reaching towards, is that That's you don't have to reach for this arbitrary you know, perfection, this impossible perfection. Right, absolutely. Do the best you can do within what you can do. Mm. That's right, doing the best <laughs> you could do with what you have. I appreciate both of you so much. Um, I also want to give a shout out to one of the, I think it was a question, I'm not sure, um, in the chat box, but um, I want to bring in the comment from Lily, hi Lily, from um, Texas, who mentioned that um, there's a struggle so many of us are facing, how do we incorporate temple life if we don't truly understand it, if we don't have our parents to guide us, and if we don't believe in the management of the temple. So I want to bring that up real quick. Do you, I don't know if you both... <laughs> Have any um, comments or reactions to that? But that's something that's also been recently in the news, right, Brian, as well. Mm -hmm. I think a first stab at that is that it can be it can be very challenging. Is that you know you know that you, know, you will often run into our elders or our parents who will um, try to compare it to um, the temples back in the old country, for example, and that this romanticization that you know, those temples had no drama, no, you know, no burps in, in process, but that they were all perfectly run. And I think that you know, the um, thing is that you know, people need to be patient with themselves and maybe they will get involved. Sometimes it can be reformed, sometimes it can't. But that's why it becomes so important then to look at what everyone was reaching towards that, you know, that if it's going to be this process, but some places you're just going to have to be um, looking, it's like, you know, looking elsewhere, yeah. but you just have to um, try and be patient then and just look at that. that you know, like, you know, for me, for example, when, it's a, when I did my board, when I was a monk there, that was a very, <laughs> that was a very haphazard and you know, awkward process then. But, you know, it left me with um, understanding and appreciating the five precepts at the end. You know, is that, you know, try not to kill anyone, don't steal from people, don't have um, sex with the wrong people, try to tell the truth and don't get too drunk. It's like, you know, and if, it's like, that's pretty good advice. So, you know, that's that's solid advice. advice. <laughs> and I I leave, that's right, we'll leave it at that. Thank oh, you. Wait, no, I got, I got one more comment though. I actually, I have um, uh, something a bit uh, practical that can help. Um, oh, yeah, sure. So, um, mm -hmm. so here's the thing. Uh, I think you know, as, as someone in the diaspora, you end up having to be your own uh, historian and uh, you have to do your own, your own work, right? Reading the books mm -hmm. and finding those things. But um, there's actually this, uh, this great, uh, this Cambodian guy who used to be a monk, uh, mm -hmm. but now, uh, but he's not anymore. But let me, let me put his handle on Instagram. It's uh, Sun Moon. And. Um, Absolutely. I think what's important too, I know we only have a, what, uh, we're a few minutes oh, uh, over, but yeah, no, that's yeah. fine. But well, I just, but yeah, go ahead. So. Just, I, I'll be very quick about it. He also has a Facebook page. He has all these wonderful videos that actually tells you the kind of the kind of language and gesture you're supposed to use when addressing monks. And you mm -hmm. know, he actually even does some meditation. So he mm -hmm. is actually, I think, that missing link for um, mm -hmm. our parents' generation and us to learn about those Buddhist things. And also, mm -hmm. at most of these temples, there were always. They want you to come. They want the younger mm -hmm. generation there. Mm -hmm. So there's always like an executive director or some person who is working as the intermediary. So find that person. And they're likely the ones creating the website. And those are the ones who you will want to uh, email. 
Um, they're the ones who are trying to get you to their very small but um, limited but you know functioning language classes at the local temple. Find those people. They are the ones who were bilingual and who can help you because they want they don't want Bo the Buddhist culture to die out here. So you know, find that intermediary. But in the meantime, go to go to this guy Prem Samuel, and he's got some wonderful videos that actually kind of detail. Um, detail the expectations within the temple like for example monks are not supposed to they can't ask for water or anything did you know that like i didn't know that so mm -hmm. like you when they come in you offer them a seat you offer them water so that things like that or that the word for eat for for uh, monks is very different from any other word for eat in Khmer. they have their mm -hmm. own herb it's cha. Mm -hmm. so things like that yep that's right that's right Thank you so much to both of you. I just want to um, recap everything that you, you both said that, you know, um, making sure that um, we're supporting the people who are these cultural barriers of our communities, right? Mm -hmm. And um, going to them, finding them. Um, sometimes it's the first step is just finding them, right? Um, finding <laughs> them, um, going to them, supporting them um, uh, financially and also in any other means with your time and talents too. Um, and, and what I've noticed too with a lot of these temples, they want you to go to the temples, but um, only recently have a lot of these temples even have Facebook pages and are socially connected on um, the internet, right? So they're learning these things. And now we're in this time of social distancing that we need to learn it even more. And it's so much more um, important and prevalent, right? So thank you for that, um, those comments too. Um, and there are a lot of language classes and other resources out there. Um, and so um, knowing that, um, that nowadays we, we have very few people with those expert knowledge um, that we can hold on to and figure out how we want to carry um, that knowledge forward through the rest of us in the next generation, right? So um, that's a great, really great ending point there. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Um, if there are any more questions um, or anything else you want to share, uh, we'll share it with, the, um, with everyone who is part of the Zoom call as well. Um, please support um, Brian and Sof um, and our cultural barriers as well. Um, and if you um, want to join us for tomorrow, we have um, Kamai Classical Dance starting at 1 o'clock um, <laughs> on U.S. Central Time. So tune into that and support that dance troupe too. Um, and late in the evening, we have a papaya salad eating contest. So it's going to be fun. We try our best. So <laughs> thank you to both of you. Happy New thank Year. It's like a very happy New Year. Bye -bye. Yes, thank you. Bye. And with that, I'll say bye. bye.